Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are still some uh, participants coming in, but I think um, I will start because I'm German. I like to start on time, and it's just a true pleasure to welcome all of you here to IEEE NCON um, in Bloomington, Indiana. Some of you might have enjoyed um, the beautiful leaf colors we have right now when driving in. Uh, I also would like to uh, do some housekeeping notes. Those of you which found parking but are not really sure if this is uh, totally legal parking, we do have um, a handout out in the registration that tells you where the parking uh, is available. Uh, you will also see that we have two um, days packed with uh, talks, with panels, with uh, demos, with tours, and of course also posters and social events. And we look forward to have you here in two buildings. One is the Cyber Infrastructure Building, in which we are right now, and the Innovation Center marked in blue uh, on this map. And there are guides out there which can also help you find the respective uh, places. Uh, in terms of uh, restrooms, they are right uh, behind that door. Um, there will be coffee behind this wall, and if there is an emergency, there is a main door uh, and exit right over there. Uh, on behalf of the program committee and the local organizing committee, we are very glad to have you here. I would like to uh, ask uh, Chris and Liesl and Bob, which are right over there, just to stand up for a moment. This is really the core organizing team. They did all the heavy lifting, in addition to all the other gentlemen and ladies here in the room, which do also the audio support and um, much of the other local support. So thanks so much <laughs> for all of you. We would like to uh, thank our sponsors and contributors. It would not be possible to organize this conference without this um, financial support and um, support in terms of uh, time and resources. And um, again, thank you to all of you which were involved in that. Um, our dean would like to welcome you as well. He's currently in India, and he sends his regards. Um, dean Raj Ahaya cares deeply about what he calls Renaissance engineering. These are engineers which are, which are creative thinkers, well-versed in the liberal arts and humanities, but also well-versed, of course, in science and technology. It is now my true pleasure to introduce our first um, two speakers, um, which will welcome you to um, this um, building, but also to uh, intelligent systems engineering here at Indiana University. And uh, the first gentleman is uh, Jeffrey Fox. He is our um, interim associate dean for engineering. He is also the chair of the intelligent systems engineering department, and he is a distinguished professor uh, in ISE. Um, Jeffrey Fox received a PhD in theoretical physics from Cambridge University, so he has the really most interesting and, and astonishing outfit whenever we have our graduation ceremonies here. Um, he uh, works in uh, applying computer science <coughs> from infrastructure to analytics in biology, pathology, sensor clouds, earthquake and ice sheet science, image processing, deep learning, manufacturing, network science, and so on. And his uh, infrastructure work is built around software-defined systems on clouds and clusters with analytics uh, focusing on scalable parallelism. Um, second um, welcome will be done by Brad Wheeler. Um, he um, is the um, IU Vice President for IT. Uh, he is the Chief Information Officer here at IU, and he's also a professor in information systems at the Kelly School of Business. Uh, you might know uh, Brad from his work as a co-founder and leader of many multi-institutional collaborations. Uh, his recent work focuses on the Unison Consortium, on Kuali, and also on IU's mass media digitization and preservation effort. So please welcome both of them here. Uh, Jeffrey will go first, and then Brad is going to take the stage after him. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm um, going to describe the Intelligent Systems Engineering Department. And the first few slides try to explain what Intelligent Systems is, and also tries to say why we're, we're not the same as some other engineering uh, activities. Uh, um, so 
intelligence. This is just all right. Um, is there any way to get? I, can, I can't hardly see that. You could to the next slide. Or the show Sorry. One. Oh, I see. Sorry, I was off by one on the slide deck here. All right, so intelligence systems uh, is at least as interpreted by us. It means the fact that, uh, let's take an example of the work I, use, I do with Kansas on analyzing data from radar flying over ice sheets. So the engineers at Kansas, they design the radar, take the data, run the MATLAB signal processing, and then that's the, that's the end of their engineering. And what we, we do is take that data, do the image processing, and find out where the uh, uh, glacier beds are and where the snow levels are. So it, we view intelligence systems engineering as going all the way from that radar through the final decision as to what the, um, what the bed of the glacier is, and then we can follow that up with an HPC simulation of the motion of the glacier and tr try to understand better why the glaciers are disappearing. And um, so that's intelligence systems. And then, then if you look at the parts of engineering that we've chosen, they tend to be those involving embedded systems, uh, small scale systems such as the Internet of Things. And as we've already, I've already given in that example, they have a big data component. And um, this picture here shows the uh, structure of the, uh, the program. Uh, <coughs> you have, uh, we have six, actually we, ha we actually have seven tracks. The one track is intelligent systems, which is sort of the middle blob. Then we have uh, six um, uh, actual specializations, which are listed around the edge. You can see their computer engineering, cyber physical systems, environmental engineering, um, nanoscale engineering, neuroengineering, and bioengineering. And notice we do not do mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and um, which are, of course, very important. In fact, they're the most popular engineering subjects, but we do not do them. Um, and uh, all right, so then in the middle we have these sort of core capabilities, and also another one we don't do is electrical engineering. Electrical engineering is is part of the program, but is not uh, taught as a separate discipline, a separate track. If you could, you could say that cyber physical systems replaces electrical engineering. And in the middle you'll see um, sensors, Internet of Things. Um, big data, a high performance computing, and of course a classical engineering, signal processing, information theory, and um, control theory. And um, this is sort of saying some of the same things again. We do, uh, as we do cyber physical systems, we do edge computing and embedded systems, and of course we have nanoscale sensors on the edge. Then in the sort of, we also do cloud computing and high performance computing, which is sort of the central resources used to interpret that data. And all students will have classes in those areas. Um, we were recently rated, I think, number 10 in the world for engineering programs having artificial intelligence, because all our students get machine learning slash artificial intelligence courses. Um, so I just wanted to note that this fits the headlines. You will see um, if you browse the web, they're all c the companies like Google, Microsoft, and so on, Facebook. They're all c and saying that they're AI-first companies. <coughs> so you could say that we are clearly targeting AI-first engineers. So maybe we can help them staff their companies. All right, so that sort of tries to get you an idea of what we're doing and why we're called intelligent systems. Uh, let's go into the last few slides. I'll give a little bit more detail. Um, so we have, at the undergraduate level, four, four of those uh, seven tracks. 
And at the uh, graduate level, we offer these three, the three tracks, the intelligence systems, environmental engineering, and neuroengineering. And uh, you can ask why we don't do everything at the undergraduate level. I can assure you it's very hard to offer, <laughs> starting from scratch, to offer all those tracks. We have more than enough, to, enough work to do. Um, the, I should say that currently, we, we'll see at the end, we have 19 faculty now. I think to offer these um, programs, as we've outlined, needs about 35 to 40 faculty which we will reach in about five years' time. Uh, we also, to show what you have to do when you set up a new program, we have 67 courses, and we have several, like robotics, we haven't actually submitted yet, so 67 courses is not so easy to, um, to rise from scratch. Some of them, are, though, are related to existing courses. Um, <coughs> All right, so here is the actual uh, undergraduate degree. And um, one interesting feature of it, is, I mean, it's a, it's a very solid engineering degree. It has 69 credits in the degree, which is comparable to those at other engineering schools. It is different from almost everything else at IU Bloomington, which has more like 45 credits than a major. So engineering here has Credits which are similar to other degree, under engineering degrees, but we try to, we at least give them the option of doing it in 120 total. Uh, like in some engineering schools, you have to do 130 credits. Um, <coughs> and below this, we give a little bit more detail about what some of the courses. There are 30 credits which are taken by everybody, and then there are. Um, groups of, of um, core courses um, in computer engineering and cyber physical systems. There are 15 credits which are in common between those two degrees. And then they separate out for the last part of their study. <laughs> and um, bio and nano have again some in common and then they separate out. The bio and nano degrees take a lot more of chemistry and biology. Uh, they have a lot of chemistry and biology in their requirements. All right. So here you can see the um, computer engineering track. And we have a total of 50 students in the first two years, 55, <coughs> sorry, 55 undergraduates. <coughs> and we're at the um, middle. We're on the right, um, we're on the second uh, year for the initial co cohort, and they're just doing intelligence systems one, computer systems, and the uh, statistics and science elective. Next semester, they'll do intelligence systems two, which I'm teaching. That's cloud computing and, and machine learning. And you can see they have a classic engineering course, signal processing, they're having cyber physical systems. So already this, core, this is the core which is um, going to give them a pretty broad, all students a broad knowledge. Then here, the last uh, two semesters at the bottom of this slide, that will be different for the CP, it's different for CPS and different for bio and different for nano. The, um, <coughs> the top part of this slide is common for all the tracks. All right, so everybody asks us whether we're ABET accredited, and the answer is easy. We're not allowed to be ABET accredited until we graduate a student, and we will try to be ABET accredited when we graduate some students in 2020. Um, and hope, and I believe that it's expected that, uh, that uh, as we're trying to keep track of our processes, so we will meet the ABET requirements. And we're reasonably optimistic. We will get the accreditation reasonably soon. And that, that will be retroactive to students here now. Um, <coughs> now. Obviously, if you're students, we have various scholarships. And we also have a pretty active um, program to support the undergraduates to do research with faculty. We support, we offer them financial support to do a summer and uh, academic year research. They can either take it for course credit or for, um, 
of, of to be paid. And we have actually, Cardi did a lot of work here. We have a nice summer camp program which we're expanding next year. Um, I should say in another, I, I didn't mention that um, we just actually, you know, there are all these things you have to do. So we've just introduced our minors at the undergraduate level because we think there are going to be quite a lot of existing IU students who want to do a minor in engineering. That's going to be f five courses. And uh, we also have a, a set of PhD minors, which uh, has all those seven tracks, but also has um, uh, big data engineering as a, an allowed track, which is also aligned with uh, how we hope to support the data science program here, offering a big uh, a data engineering track in data science. So you can sort of see how we've managed to uh, take our core engineering concepts and expand them into these uh, intelligence systems areas. And my last slide is the faculty. Um, those at the top in black are the least important. They're the existing faculty and the tenured. The, the heart of our, our faculty is those in brown. They are um, the new faculty. And you can see they are We've already, we've actually hired effectively people in all six tracks. Um, if we're, like Lan Tao Lu, he is actually a cyber physical systems, but he's applying cyber physical systems to marine robots and, um, and so he sort of, he has an environmental flavor to his work and we have a couple of people in neuroengineering and, and we have the intelligence systems. Minji well, is in that, that he's in, he was our first hire in intelligence assistance, Minji Kim, and we expect to hire more in that area this this uh, this year. So we already so we have effectively all our programs started, but to really offer us an undergraduate degree in bioengineering, you're going to need or actually any of these tracks, you need around eight faculty, and so it's not possible, I believe, to offer a full-fledged undergraduate track without some faculty numbers such as that for each of the tracks. <coughs> and that's how we get this number of 35 to 40 total faculty, in a, which we'll reach hopefully in around five years, which will be a sort of preliminary, fully staffed for these initial plans. Thank you. Now it's Brad Vila's turn. Thank you, Jeffrey. Let me uh, say it was two years ago this month that I took over as uh, interim dean for the School of Informatics and Computing for a short period of time until uh, Dean Acharya uh, came on board. And I had the opportunity to work with uh, both Jeffrey and Cotty. Uh, what they haven't mentioned is they are both distinguished professors at IU. That is that most rarefied air. Uh, at IU, and a, a great achievement. Uh, Jeffrey talked a little bit about the Intelligent Systems Engineering program, but I hope you can get your head around how much work that was to start a clean sheet from the ground engineering program. The Bloomington campus did not have engineering. There's another school up to, I don't know, the Northwest somewhere that does engineering. and. Uh, so that was not part of the Bloomington program, but they've got this off the ground, and as you can see, uh, Jeffrey Cotty and her colleagues, they are building the next generation of engineering program for cloud computing, devices, and all the things that you see, and I cannot tell you how hard Jeffrey has worked in all the interviews, just even the first year bringing 19 candidates or 23 candidates in. Uh, for recruiting, so they've really done it. Uh, my job is uh, to be Vice President for Information Technology. I'm a professor in the Business School. I want to welcome you to the Cyber Infrastructure Building. This is where 550 people call home uh, every day uh, in this building, and we've got a couple hundred in buildings adjacent to us. Uh, if you don't know a lot about Indiana University, here's a few factoids. We're about a three and a half billion dollar enterprise, about 100,000 students. Blessedly, they are not all here at this campus. That is across all of our campuses. We are not a system like you might see in a California or Wisconsin 
We are a single university, a line authority, single university. Our IT shops, our finance shops, our research technologies support all our faculty and students uh, everywhere they, they are. You can see about 20,000 uh, faculty and staff. 650,000 living alumni who all have a view on our basketball program, of whether it's going up or down at any particular moment. And uh, you can see a few action items we've done here o over time. The other thing we're a little different in, and I think relevant to your topics today, uh, the way we are organized, Office of the Vice President for IT, uh, we are a single shared service entity that over 20 years has only been led by two full professors of the academy. So the heart and soul of the enterprise is in the heart and soul of the mission, and that is research and education. So you can see here a lot of lines and such, but uh, a large research technology shop, a large teaching and learning classroom shop, clinical affairs with the med school, nursing, et, et cetera. Then we've got a lot of services and support uh, uh, as well. Uh, pretty big operation, as you can see over there, about 1,050 uh, people. We run about 20 million in contracts and grants a year in this shop partnered with IU faculty. If you uh, walk out to, to the restrooms out this back door, you'll see the Global Network Operations Center, which is the heart of operations for Internet 2, for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for some of your state networks in Pennsylvania and Oklahoma and, and, and other places, as well as links that the NSF has funded to uh, Asia and to Europe and then on down from Europe uh, to uh, Africa. In front of you, you've got a few little fun factoids about things the shop does. When you're taking care of 20,000 faculty and staff and 100,000 students at any moment, we typically have about 250,000 devices touching the IU network at any moment. Not everyone takes care of their security hygiene at a level that I wish that they would. So we, we're doing a lot of things. So you can see some of those factoids uh, on the screen in front of you. Uh, I really believe collaboration is strategy. I, you're interested in something, I'm interested in something. I put my piece with your piece. We try to make the coordination as light as we can and we achieve something more. So here you see this just menagerie of deep collaborations that we're involved in from cybersecurity to research technologies, libraries, the Hathi Trust, I think is one of those phenomenal things that we've uh, ever done. So you see these partnerships around, and we are deeply, deeply engaged in uh, many of these. Cotty mentioned one of the newest ones, Unison, around uh, teaching and learning. You can think of it as uh, reducing the cost and improving the services around content, whether it's open educational resources or it's licensed deals from the textbooks to get those darn books to cost a whole bunch less. The interaction platforms in the middle, whether it's Canvas or e-readers or things like that, and then ultimately the big data. How do we know if particular teaching practices or sequences are doing better? There's a little bit of a definition of some of those. Cotty can make the slides uh, available. But I hope that what we're showing you is we are deeply engaged in the life of the mission here. So if you take some of the tours today or tomorrow, here's a few things that you may see. Uh, one is Jetstream. And Jetstream was funded by the National Sciences uh, Foundation. It's about a $12 million initiative. And you kind of think about it like the Staples commercial. It's the big red easy button. If you need high performance computing uh, resources, you need to connect to some data sets, you want to run it from your iPad, you want to make a place where you and your discipline and your colleagues work together, that's what Jetstream does. It manufactures virtual environments where you can put your stuff, the people that you collaborate with, and NSF has just got us running full bore on that and wanting us to do more. You see Big Red 2 down here uh, in the bottom. It was the first university-owned petaflop supercomputer, uh, and that's all for IU researchers here. Uh, Big Red 2 has a little cousin beside it, Big Red 2 Plus right now. So uh, if you've not been through a big data center and want to see the craze and all, uh, go get a selfie with Big Red. Uh, he poses really well. Media digitization and preservation. I don't know how your eight-track tape player is doing. I can't find mine. Uh, or more directly, your wax cylinder player. 
So we are currently involved in a bicentennial initiative led by our president, IU, uh, IU President Michael McRobbie, to digitize our time-based media, audio and video. So if you think about uh, things on digital audio tape, reel-to-reel, uh, -reel, records, all those things, we are at an era where the devices that will play them are no longer available. Sony has stopped all manufacture of tape products. So those massive libraries of Sony Betamax tape and things that news stations have and all, they're not even making the parts for the machines to read those any longer. So there's a massive digitization effort. We are running 280,000 items through to digitize of audio video that'll throw off seven petabytes of storage that is in partnership with Sony and a company called Memnon. And we just announced phase two, and that will be, IU has about 90,000 films. We have quite a film collection. We're gonna digitize our, our most precious 25,000 films. 25,000 films will throw off 35 petabytes of data. So think what machine learning is going to learn as it chews through about 40 to almost 50 petabytes of data from time-based media uh, objects. We just finished our major statewide IT conference, and I think it's a bit timely to some of the topics here. Uh, it's called In the Age of the Smart Machine. Here is the book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power. It was written by uh, Shoshana Zuboff, professor at the Harvard Business School in 1988. Think about that. 1988, and as I look at the title for your conference, uh, I am really reminded as we head into more about technologies for humans, we got a lot to think about, how it changes our lives. Yesterday, my phone freaked me out a little bit. It, it told me a flight was arriving or departing at a certain time, and I, I Google told me that. I, uh, uh, it was a flight I booked for a friend. I, it was not on my calendar. Um, how did the Google know that? And it's just a little creepy. Uh, second point I'll raise here, this is a book by our Vice President for Research, Bulk Collection, a magnificent new book out about how much data is being mopped up many times without our consent and what are the laws around the world. Deep dive in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in the United States, and most of you know the Europeans have given this a bit more thought. Uh, than we have with some of the regulations that they have coming out now. But our two keynote speakers there, Shoshana Zuboff at the bottom, and uh, Dan Gear. Uh, if you Google statewide IT and IU, you'll stumble around, you'll find this. Dan Gear's remarks on cybersecurity were the most profound cybersecurity talk I have ever heard in my life. He is a, a CISO for a not-for-profit that has some funding from the CIA, and that's all I'll say. Let's just say he's one of those guys that runs in those circles, and his remarks were absolutely profound. We have his written remarks as well. It's one of those that it's almost better read because you have to think about every sentence in what he said. So deeply engaged in these things, and I'll, I'll finish this up with, this appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Ed yesterday. Uh, Jeffrey Salingo, who was the editor of the Chronicle some years ago, uh, there's a full report that has been written about this. But for higher education, I see the academy in its operations and its enablement and in its services, whether it's libraries or computation or systems or even degree programs taught across institutions, increasingly taking on the model that academics have used for years. Our faculty collaborate on research with partners everywhere. We've learned how to do that in a fairly frictionless way. Uh, he's making the argument here for the networked university through intentional uh, coalitions, collaborations, and such. And we have been pursuing this strategy for the better part of 15 years around here. And we start to see some really good outcomes. So welcome to Indiana University. I hope you'll avail yourself uh, to the tours for media digitization next door, go over to the data center, see Big Red, tweet a photo with uh, Big Red 2, uh, see the Global Network Operations Center behind here, and I just have to tell you how passionate and proud I am to be part of Indiana University and to, with Cotty and the whole program committee, host you here today at IU. Thank you. <laughs>